Hi everyone, I'm here to talk about the books that I read in March of 2023. This is gonna be one of the longer videos just because I read so much in March, but I will try to keep it as succinct as possible. The first book that I want to talk about is a reread that I did via audiobook, and that's for Daisy Jones and the Six. I chose to reread this one with my friend Rachel because the limited series on Amazon Prime came out. I don't actually own a physical copy of the book anymore because I prefer the audiobook experience. If you couldn't tell, I quite enjoyed the time I spent listening to the audiobook. It has a full cast and with the format of the story being in sort of news articles and interviews and stuff like that, it worked really well just to have this full cast embody those characters. I love the experience of getting to see the story of Daisy Jones and the band The Six play out over the years. The book contains a lot of nuance when it comes to the characters and their development. You have to kind of read between the lines sometimes and sometimes it's explicitly stated and I like that we get different perspectives on different scenarios from different characters. It's just a very interesting and smart and clever read and I really enjoyed the experience of just listening to the audiobook again and letting the story take me away. It is not actually a book that I would normally be drawn to. That's not an era that I particularly look for in the books I read, but with Daisy Jones and the Six it just feels very special and different and I enjoyed rereading that one. The next book that I finished in the month is from an author I'm familiar with. It is also a reread. I actually read this one for the first time in December and then I decided that I wanted to listen to the audiobook. The Last Tale of the Flower Bride by Roshni Chakshi. This is her adult debut novel and I absolutely loved it the second time around. Like I had already enjoyed it the first time because it felt like the book happened to me versus me reading the book. It felt like I was really immersed in this sort of modern fairy tale in the grimmest sense story that Chakshi has woven together. I particularly like how this explores relationships. It explores marriage but it also explores friendship. It explores growing up and it also kind of doesn't shy away from incorporating some fantastical elements in a way that feels very vivid and the imagery really comes across well. I genuinely just fell in love with this book all over again. I'm glad I actually chose to reread it just because it made the experience even more intense in a good way. I genuinely felt swept away by the story. There's such a contrast between light and dark, between what is real and what is fairy tale, between the real world and the magical world in this one. And I just feel like it was written in such a truthful, raw, organic, real way and that just really appealed to me. It is an odd book. It's not gonna work for everyone but for me I just I felt like Chokshi really achieved something special in the way that she brought her vision and her truth to life with her words. The next book that I'm gonna talk about is by an author that I've already read quite a few books from and that is One for My Enemy by Olivia Blake which is my favorite of her books so far. I really enjoyed this book. I had a feeling I would just based on the setup. It's got Romeo and, and Juliet vibes, it's got fairy tale vibes, it's set in New York, it's got witches, like what more could I ask for? It genuinely was a fun reading experience for me, especially given the way that Olivia Blake played with the format a bit in this story. There are a lot of things about this one that really appealed to me when I was reading it. There's banter, there's witty commentary, there's an interesting cast of characters that feel really fun to follow and also have very complicated and nuanced relationships between the lot of them. I thought that was cool. There's already nods to other things like Shakespeare and fairy tales. I love when that happens in books. And then there's also a clever plot that it just kept twisting in ways that I wasn't expecting as I read it. And I love that. I love being surprised by things. Even though I probably should have seen it coming, I felt like I was constantly getting surprised by this book. I knew very early on that this was going to be a book that I enjoyed, and it was. Blake really knows how to tell a story, and I'm here for any story she has left to tell. The next book is The Foxglove King by Hannah Witten. I was drawn to it simply because it had death magic as part of the setting of the world. I really don't know what that says about me as a person, but I'm always interested to see how an author is going to incorporate that into their story. Hannah Witten has actually not only woven death magic into her story, but she's created this whole pantheon of gods and lore and history that informs the current political and religious climate of her story. And the characters were likable enough. It all really came together to weave a tale that was pretty heavy on the court intrigue and power plays. 
which is not normally my thing in most fantasy reads. I'm finding I tend to prefer quest journey stories, but I do think that because the stakes were high, the consequences were pretty dire. You know, these characters were basically having to investigate and do things for the sake of their own lives staying stable. It definitely lent some gravity to the story. But this was balanced pretty well because there's also like some witty repartee and there were like some offhand remarks that kind of made me laugh too. This one read a little bit younger. It felt like it could have been upper YA and not adult. And the pacing does go into a lull somewhere in the middle of the story. But the landing is pretty solid and it has me curious about how the sequel will play out. The next five things that I read were all Attack on Titan manga volumes. I read from volume 19 to 23 which finishes a particular arc in that series. Honestly I had no idea what I was expecting and I kind of can't quite believe the landing place we're at <laughs> with the series. I've jokingly said that I stopped reading it after volume 23 because I didn't want anything else to happen. Like I am still worried and concerned for all of these individuals that I have come to know and love over the course of 23 volumes now, which is about two thirds of the way through the series. I honestly had never dreamed that I was going to enjoy reading the Attack on Titan manga so much, but the storytelling is really sharp. The concept is pretty clever. I love the way that it's being executed, even when it brings me pain. <laughs> the author really knows his stuff when it comes to like the pacing and giving me just enough to build these characters up in my mind. I do plan to finish the series before the year ends, although I'm very terrified of finding out how it ends. I feel like only back things can happen and it's always hard for me especially when I'm attached. There is a particular character I'm attached to. Armin is my favorite and I will be very sad should something happen to Armin. I don't know. I haven't been spoiled yet so there's that. I also read for our family book club You Are a Global Citizen which is by Damon Dominique. It was a quick read but it was really nothing that stayed with me because it was more about asking yourself questions and reflecting on the aspects of your life that build you up into who you are and the kind of choices you make. We had a fun time discussing it you know, amongst ourselves, but other than that, it didn't really stay with me, unfortunately. The next book was my buddy read with Danica for the month, and that was Kai Kei by Vashnavi Patel. I always gravitate towards stories that are about female characters from mythology, especially when the author is able to give them a voice, a new life, really, and to sort of give us an idea of what their perspective could have or maybe was. In this case, I'm not as familiar with the source material, which is the Ramayana, but the way that Patel told Kaike's story was super compelling. Like I was really into it from the beginning all the way until the end. The writing flowed really well. I was interested in seeing what would happen next for Kai Kei, especially given all the obstacles that she ends up facing over the course of her lifetime. It was definitely a compelling read and I'm glad I was able to pick it up. Next we have a book that has gotten a lot of buzz recently and that is Divine Rivals which is by Rebecca Ross. This is the second novel I've read from this author. I actually read her adult debut first and it's definitely not going to be my last. There is something about this author's writing style that I found works for me as long as I'm reading it, you know, in the right moment. The storytelling always starts off a bit slower as she sets up the world and the characters a little bit, but everything eventually comes together once the readers have gotten a lay of the land and of these characters and who they are. I felt like there were a lot of things that felt familiar and almost like they could be part of the real world, but I also think that the subtle things that Rebecca Ross wove in, like the gods and the magic part, and the relationship dynamic between our two main characters is what really ended up becoming the things that I love the most about this book, and I'm very curious to see where it's going to go, especially how it ends. I have a thing right now where like all the authors who are writing duologies end the first book in ways that give me pain and also have me dying to read the next one. So I guess it works. I guess it's effective. <laughs> next book that I read was Belladonna, which is by Adeline Grace. This is another one with a touch of death in it. It's got death personified and it's also got some magic related to death. Unlike the majority of fantasy books I read that actually features death or necromancy or death magic of some sort, Belladonna felt different because it's a contained plot, because it's a murder mystery with a very limited setting. It was something that I had to adjust to because I'm so used to just experiencing death magic type things in like bigger epic sagas or journey and quest stories. But once I had settled into the way this was written, I actually found myself hooked. This is my first experience with Adeline Grace, and I do feel like she excels with creating an atmospheric setting. I really like that. There was actually some secret garden vibes in there, which I enjoyed. And the lore was interesting in and of itself because it's not something I have encountered exactly the way she portrays it. I also like the plot and the characters well enough to care about what the outcome of the story would be, although I kind of wish my personal investment was a little bit higher. I am still very curious about the sequel so I'm probably gonna pick that up at some point. And then another family book club 
catalog. I was a little behind at this point. Finlay Donovan is Killing It, which is by Al Cosimano. I've seen this one a lot online. Like, I feel like a lot of people really loved it, especially this first book. So I was kind of excited when my sister decided that that was what we were going to read together. I genuinely just went into it hoping for a fun time, and that is exactly what I got with this book. There is a lot of suspension of disbelief that's got to happen here, and that's something that I think you know, when you start this book, you already know you're gonna have to do that, or at least I did, given the sheer, you know, wildness of some of the twists and turns of the stories. It's just shenanigans and fun and a mystery that will keep you amused from start to end. It felt very much like how I felt when I was reading Dal A for Aunties, which is a book that I thoroughly enjoyed but also had to suspend my disbelief with. It was just plain entertainment. It was just something that made me laugh and kept me hooked and you know it was just a fun time and I genuinely enjoyed it. I then read Mariquette and the Ocean of Stars which is by Caris Avendano Cruz. This is very much geared towards younger readers and I have no doubt that if I had read it as a child I would have loved this book. It would have been one of my favorites and I probably would have reread it over and over again. It is a wonderful whimsical story about a girl named Mariquette who ends up on a journey that allows her to understand more about herself and her history and her relationships. It incorporates a lot of Filipino lore, which I found really enjoyable, and it also made it an extra special thing to read. It is so cool that we get stories like this one on shelves now, and I hope to see more in the future, that's for sure. Then I read Untethered Sky, which is a novella from Fonda Lee. She is the author of the Greenbone Saga, and this standalone novella is unrelated to that. It is hit or miss for me sometimes with novellas, especially if they're not already parts of series that I liked, but this one worked really well. It felt very much like a slice of life story covering the period of her life where the main character Esther is with her rock Zara. Fondly did a very good job bringing me into this world, introducing me to this, these characters, and then telling me the story of this portion of their lives in a way that was compelling and I got invested even though it was very brief. I would probably want to read more set in this world if she decided to write it. It was just such an interesting setup. One of the books that I have enjoyed the most this year, and my copy's kind of beat up now, is Book Lovers by Emily Henry. This is one of my top Emily Henry reads. I've been a fan since her adult debut, but what I particularly loved about this one is that it has those small town hallmark rom-com vibes. It has a realistic twist. I enjoyed getting to know the main character and being in her head. It was also fun to see her relationship blossom, the romantic one specifically. I love the chemistry between them and the banter too, but I also liked that this one had an aspect of sisterhood in it. That really got to me. It made me cry in the end and yeah, I mean, like, honestly, if a book can manage to make me sob like that, it's top tier. A book that really surprised me was This Vicious Grace, which is by Emily Teed. This is something that I went into expecting to enjoy, given that it has the romance with a bodyguard trope in it. But I honestly did not anticipate being as invested in the story as I ended up being. So this does have a lot of the hallmarks of a typical YA fantasy, but I do feel like eventually it finds its own footing and Theed's storytelling really shines in the way that she's able to depict the main character Alessa and her internal and external struggles. I also really love Dante, who is the love interest, but that's obviously to be expected just because he's already my type fictionally. The plot definitely escalates at a very good pace and I feel like the ending, it stuck the landing and it also left it open enough that I'm very curious about how the second book is now going to play out. I also really enjoyed the dialogue. I love the banter between a lot of the characters, also specifically our main couple, and I was totally rooting for the romance. To be honest, at the beginning this felt very typical YA fantasy, but at some point something clicked for me and I found myself just on the edge of my seat trying to figure out where the story was going to go. I also read Violet Made of Thorns, which is by Gina Chen. I had high hopes for this one, but unfortunately it ended up not being my cup of tea. Things I do think worked well here were the way that the fairy tale elements were incorporated. It felt very refreshing and new, and it would sometimes turn these things on their head, and I thought that was really clever. I also really like the explosive and often antagonistic dynamic between the main couple who are Violet and Cyrus. That's kind of obvious from their interactions from the beginning all the way till the end. And I do think the themes that the author was exploring, whether they were intentional or not, were interesting because it had a lot to do with fate 
and power and personal agency. The plot itself I kind of struggled with because it was a bit slow at the beginning, all the way through two thirds actually, and it was really the end where things kind of picked up for us. The ending was actually pretty solid and that's what actually makes me mildly curious about the next book. I also felt didn't feel particularly strongly about the characters unfortunately, although I do think the way that Violet is portrayed is really morally gray. I do kind of wish we had gotten to know her and Cyrus a little bit better or more intimately or at least that I had felt more personally connected to both. It definitely affected my overall experience with this one and unfortunately it just wasn't for me. I also finished out a series in March and that is a, the These Hollow Vow series. The second book is These Twisted Bonds and it is by Lexi Ryan. This was a long book and it actually felt it and it took me longer to read than I thought it would. While I still thought that the way the lore played out was pretty organic and the story was easy enough to follow and would at times get real interesting, there were parts of it that I really enjoyed, I did feel like the execution was unevenly paced and I also feel like there were moments that definitely took me out or could have just been taken out to begin with just to make it shorter and more concise. I, I think sometimes there are gratuitous moments that are kept not for the sake of the plot but more for the sake of the genre or the trope that you're going for and in this one I could feel that pretty heavily. I still think it was a solid way to end the story overall, it just wasn't my favorite if that makes sense. I still preferred the way the first book played out. The second to the last thing I'm going to talk about is Foul Lady Fortune by Chloe Gong. This is part of her secret Shanghai universe but it is the first in its own duology. It is honestly one of my favorite things that I have read this year and I'm not too surprised because I have loved Chloe's other books. Her writing in this one just works so well in all its aspects. Like she does a good job establishing the setting and the setup for our characters. She does a great job bringing these characters to life. Like they've all worm their way into my heart so easily and I get so amused and so distressed with all of their antics and dynamics and the things they get into, whether it's things that they chose or things that they're forced into. Honestly, the story was so compelling that I just barely could put it down once I had started it. I definitely had such a fun reading experience with this one and I'm honestly super excited for the sequel. Like, I am excited and terrified for it because ah, so many things that happened in the first one that like just got to me. It just got to me. Honestly, I'm pretty sure the second one's gonna be explosive and I cannot wait to be decimated yet again. The last couple of things I'm gonna be talking about that I read in the month of March are all in the Reordin verse. And it includes all of these books as well as some others. So I read the rest of the Heroes of Olympus series. That's The Son of Neptune, The Mark of Athena, The House of Hades, and The Blood of Olympus. That's four chunky books. I also read The Demigod Files and The Demigod Diaries, which are shorter books that include some like interviews, some stories, stuff like that. Actually, I think those are all just the short stories. I can't remember right now off the top of my head. I thoroughly enjoyed being back in this world again and being on this journey with these characters. I feel like a broken record when I'm talking about these rereads, but honestly, I cannot impress to you how much I enjoyed re-experiencing this entire saga for myself. I think the Heroes of Olympus in particular is very special to me because I feel like it is a series that really wormed its way into my heart all those years ago when I read it for the first time, and that still remains true today. It is just so well written. It's clever. It's building on what started in Percy Jackson, and it kind of takes it to a new place, a whole new level, and then brings it towards endgame status by the end of it, if that makes any sense. It probably will only make sense if you read the series. Not only are we encountering new characters and new situations and new aspects of the world that we barely knew existed in the Percy Jackson series, but Riordan really expands on that and does it in a way that feels like it makes sense and it could be real. And watching our characters have to grow up and go through the situations they go through and try to find their own strength and find the answers and figure things out and prevent all of these cataclysmic events from happening. It was the most epic journey that I could have ever imagined. I know most of the hallmarks of it, but having the experience of it all over again really got to me and I fell so much more deeply in love with the series. I love it so much. I love these characters so much and I was rooting for them every step of the way. I was there with them in their lowest of lows. I was there with them when they were celebrating their highs. They made me laugh. They made me cry and I hold a special spot in my heart for the cast of the Heroes of Olympus series. I love them so much. I just do. I just do. And I love the series so much and could happily recommend it to anyone, really. Those are all the books that I ended up reading during March. It was a lot of books. It was a good reading month and I'm glad I felt like I got my bojo back after a very brief feb where I didn't get to read as much. I will see you guys with a new video soon. Bye! Bye.